Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about the Cisco hierarchical network model. Specifically, you're going to learn about what Cisco calls the core distribution and access layers of a campus network. The information is rather straightforward, but it is information you'll need to know very well to do well on your CCDA exam. So let's begin. The most important idea concerning the Cisco hierarchical network model is the step-by-step -step construction of the network, which implements one module at a time, starting with the foundation. The implementation of each module can be supervised by a network architect, but the details are covered by a specialized team, such as routing or security or voice teams. This modular approach is the key to simplifying the network. Before we cover each module within the network model, let's talk about the main advantages of the Cisco hierarchical network model. There are eight key advantages. Ease to understand and implement, flexibility, cost savings, modularity, it's easily modified, it allows for network growth, it facilitates summarization, of networks and there is also built-in fault isolation. The three-tier model was created in order to make the construction of networks easier to understand. Cisco has always tried to make efficient and cost-effective networks with a modular structure so they can easily be divided into building blocks. The modular network design facilitates modifications in certain modules after their implementation and makes it easy to track faults in the network. The Cisco hierarchical network model is defined by three layers, the core or backbone layer, the distribution layer, and the access layer. Now, if you're working for a small company, these layers might be collapsed. Core and distribution are often collapsed into a single layer, or sometimes all three layers are collapsed. That being said, let's dive into each of the layers. The access layer is the on-ramp to the network. So for the most part, any end user or device that wants to connect to the network will do so via the access layer. As you can see, access layer switches should have redundant connectivity to the distribution layer. This will ensure network connectivity for the hosts even when there is an equipment failure. You could take it another step further and provide redundant connectivity for the host to the access layer switches, but this is the exception to the rule and certainly not the norm. The access layer is comprised of layer two switches, workstations, IP telephones, or any other device that requires access to the network. Here are some specific features you should be aware of at the access layer. It should provide high availability and flexible security features. You can also implement authentication, broadcast control, and it's where you would define QoS trust boundaries. In the access layer, you would also implement rate limiting techniques, and it's where you would often program spanning tree protocol, include power over ethernet for your phones, and configure voice VLAN settings. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to both the access and core layers. The distribution layer is often where the brains of the network resides, since many decisions such as filtering, quality of service, and policy-based routing are performed in the distribution layer. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to the access and core layers. The distribution layer normally has advanced layer three switches that can support a wide array of functionality to support the services required from this layer. Here are the attributes of the distribution layer. It gives access control to core devices. It has redundancy to access devices. It's where the boundaries are for routing protocols. 
you, redistribution occurs at this layer, as well as filtering, route summarization, policy routing, and here you will see your security implemented. It provides separate multicast and broadcast domains using layer two and layer three technologies and provides routing between VLANs. It is a media translation and provides boundaries for media and also provides redistribution. There is a lot going on in the core layer. The high-speed switching fabric ensures that all modules which connect to the core are serviced immediately. You rarely will put any programming on these switches that could cause them to slow down processing. For example, no QoS, no ACLs. Rather, you want to keep it so that these high-end switches spend their time processing forwarding traffic rather than doing anything else. Although it's not always required to have redundancy to and from the distribution and access layers, redundancy is certainly required in the core. As you can see, the core is the hub for the interconnects in the network. It connects to the server farm, to the distribution layer, and then off to the enterprise edge as well. So having a high performing core is critical. Here are some key features of the core layer that you will want to memorize. The core layer is high speed, it's reliable, it's redundant, it has fault tolerance and load balancing, it has manageability and scalability. In the core layer there are no filters, packet handling or other overhead that would slow traffic down or the processing of traffic down. It has a limited but consistent diameter and it can provide quality of service. The Cisco Core Distribution and Access Layer Hierarchical Model is rather straightforward, but that's the point. Cisco wants you to know this by memory and the features of each of the modules in preparation for your CCDA exam. Not only by watching this video are you prepared for your CCDA exam regarding these areas, you're also a much better engineer now that you understand the basic organization of a campus network. Good luck in your studies.